Hello, everybody, and welcome back, the seditionists. It has been a while. We've been uh, both busy. We're both educators, so, you know, springtime with uh, the testing and everything else that goes on and all the clubs that start rolling around. So Keith and I have been a little busy. He and I haven't really had a chance to talk in a while either, so it's sort of nice to see my old friend again. Um, Keith, welcome. Welcome back. How you doing, buddy? Doing okay. Good to see you. Um, we just found out this week that Discovery Elementary School is both a National Wildlife Federation Green Flag School and a U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon School. And I was the wow. point man for both of those application processes, so I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> Congratulations. That's fantastic. You. And your, your building is just second to none. I mean, well, what an amazing location, amazing teachers and staff. So you have a right to be proud. Good for you. Thanks. Um, Today, I, I wanted to bring up a topic that, that I think um, is interesting, timely, and maybe a little sensitive to some of the more traditional teachers. Um, but then again, when have we ever shied away from sort of telling it like it is, right? You know it. Um, I, I want to throw in this idea. We, I've been doing a lot of reading on artificial intelligence and virtual reality and how it's really just sort of taken a step in a big direction lately and then how it's just become this remarkable uh, bit of technology and 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 you and i have told said many many times how we are vehemently vehemently opposed to some of that uh, old traditional style of teaching the lecture style of teaching uh worksheet we, we call them packet professors and things like that right so so here's my thought and i want to hear your ideas on it artificial intelligence the alexas the google homes all those things they're, they're able, their, their ability to listen to a question and respond is becoming pretty intense. And I've read some articles on, we, uh, many of the big educational gurus, gurus are saying this is going to be your tutoring for, for, for students in the very near future because you can ask it a question, it can give you a response, it can ask you a question, it can diagnose your answers. There's a lot going on with that AI. Uh, couple it with virtual reality, and you could see kids you know, having a virtual reality headset on, actually being in ancient Rome when you're talking about ancient Roman history, and getting questions and answers back and forth with this AI computer. So my question to you, Keith, and, and to the audience at large is, how are teachers, quality teachers, going to deal with this? And then what are going to happen to those packet professors and those lecture heavy, either even higher ed teachers who seem to do it even more so than, 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 than your traditional education area K-12? What is going to be the impact of this? I have my opinions, but I want to hear yours too. So go ahead. I think there are probably, I think I've got it in my head as three distinctions that we would need to make initially. And I'd be an idiot if I said I didn't have entire chapters on this very subject. So it's very near and dear to my heart. First, we have to separate training and teaching. I don't believe that those are the same things. I don't consider, and I know this is a harsh statement for some people that like this sort of thing, I don't consider lecture to be teaching. It's its own distinct skill. That's why the people who do that should and many times are called lecturers. That's its own thing, but that is not the same as teaching. I don't know very many college professors that are teachers. They are lecturers and they are content experts, they are publishers and they are researchers, but teaching to me is a distinct craft that has to be held up as, as one particular thing. So training versus teaching is an important distinction and there are a lot of people who are in our classrooms who are trainers, not teachers. We also have to separate in our minds virtual environments within the hands of an authentic teaching practitioner and virtual, uh, virtual environments within the hands of a trainer. Right, So the virtual environments piece of that could be used in two different ways. And the final distinction, I think, is the difference between genuinely teaching, right, something that's actually facilitating individualized learning through meaningful pedagogy and instructional opportunity and design, versus computer-aided testing. CAT is an even really good adaptive testing is still a separate thing from teaching. So that having been said, obviously you and I have a great background in virtual environments and I've long been a proponent for far longer than most people who have been involved in VE and education that it, it's very powerful tool. Could it be used to create an environment in which you feel as though you are situated in a training scenario and be given adaptive computerized testing to practice skills? Yes. 
Is that the same thing as teaching? No, I don't think it is. I think that's an example of training. Could it be really good at that training? Sure, absolutely. And for teachers, which I think gets to the heart of your point, for people who are employed as educators who are spending all their day trying to train their kids into fact fluency and regurgitation and recall, I agree with your underlying premise that you put forward, your, or your supposition, that these technologies could replace that kind of training. Training is by definition the attempt to replicate thinking in another person. That's a very carbon copy thing. A computer can do that. I don't think that teaching in the way that I think you and I would define it could be replaced by anything less than reaching the singularity and having an authentic artificial intelligence at which time we've got much bigger problems than we're going to be tackling in this video. Isn't that the truth? And, 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 I, and I agree, and thank you for putting it so nicely, because um, I think that's exactly where we're going. Um, the, the way I've been sort of defining this for myself after having read this, because I find it really interesting. Way back when, uh, I watched this video from, I want to say it was Corning, called A Day of Glass. And they showed future things that they were using, and the kids were walking around in a park with their glass tablets looking up, and they would see a dragon, they would see, a, not a dragon, excuse me, a dinosaur, and then they'd walk over to this post, and it would tell them all about, and it was very interactive because of the virtual reality aspect of it. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. And you could do that now just by putting your VR glasses It's true, AR there. is here. Yeah, so, so, so what, what does that do to a teacher? And, and I think the difference is the human element. And I've been using that word, that, that term a lot, the human element, because I think, again, for those trainers that, that we call teachers these days, you know, the idea of the worksheets and the idea of just standing up there and talking at kids, all of that stuff can and, and probably at some point should uh, be, be done with computers. And that's fine. That's the way we're going. So what's a teacher going to do to separate themselves from a, a much more cost-effective version, which I know, let's face it, everything boils down to money, um, a much more cost-effective version, and that's bringing the human element. Because we can teach, at least as far as I understand, a computer cannot teach yet compassion, integrity, uh, morality, uh, love, and all of, those, all of those other elements that a human teacher puts into play. So not only is, is a child going to get probably similar content on either end, but a teacher is going to be able to bring about that human element that not only teaches the child the, the, the facts and the content, but also the morality behind using those facts and those content and that whole other area of things that sort of we just assume it happens because we've always been human to human interaction. What are your thoughts on that? As a pro-child uh, educator, I don't think that one can or should dismiss the human element. Um, I agree that as I write about, and we talk about frequently, I, I do believe that love is the central pillar of everything that we do in education. Um, and, and I have sought in some ways to define and, and to describe that in a meaningful way, but I do think that it is a valid point that human learning is more than simply skills and content. Um, I, I think it is critical and I don't, again, because we have not reached a point of a genuine AI that could truly replicate the entirety of the human mind and the human experience. I won't get into metaphysics too much, but I don't think that you could remove that and still have the same outcomes. We are deeply adhering to the responsive classroom model. You, a machine is going to have a very difficult time, at least in the state of technology as I understand it, and since I'm an educational technology professional, I understand it pretty well. The, um, collaboration and and uh, empathy and you know self-regulation these are not things that a machine I don't think I don't think these are trainable things. These are teachable things. That having been said, I think that the very privatizers who will seek to take advantage of the cost effectiveness mechanism, and I'm glad you brought that up, because that is something that the, the, the uninvested taxpayer, and I know that some people get frustrated with that statement, but I'm like, if you don't have kids and your kids don't go to the school and you pay taxes, you're not invested in the outcomes. The uninvested taxpayer is going to say, how can I get my tax burden lowered? And if there's a way to do that through replacing even one or two salaried teachers, I don't have to pay health care costs to the machine. Shouldn't we pursue that? Again, training being one thing, you can't replicate that with 
technology. But I do think that they're going to be un those uninvested taxpayers are uncompelled by the humanist arguments. And that's one of the reasons the privatizers, I think, always fail. And they do. They always fail because they don't understand that teaching is rooted deeply in a liberal arts and a humanities concept. It's holistic. It understands the whole individual child. And it's that individual aspect that is going to be critically missing from any kind of homogenizing training apparatus. So it, yes, it does remove the humane elements, those liberal arts, those humanitarian aspects, the humanities aspects that we know are so critical. But even in the hardest of hard sciences, even in algebra or physics, you're still not going to be able to accomplish what you need to accomplish in terms of teaching the individual while controlling for all modalities and inclusive of the ethical and moral components that are critical without a human being designing that instruction and ensuring that the pedagogy is individualized. Otherwise, we will end up with that we did it because we could bring about the end of the world and manatize the eschaton sort of psychopathy that many of the doomsday scenarios predict. If you don't have a handle on the individual, then you can't understand that child's motivations, their uh, modalities and the way they thrive, their preferences, their home situation. Those are not invalid points of data. And we have to make sure that we refer to them as such when approaching these privatizers who are going to want to pull all of that out on the basis of economy. So you're right. It is, it's not just the human element from the soft perspective, which we know is not invalid. It's critical and essential. But even from the hard angle, a machine still can't accomplish the goal the way we need it accomplished. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. The, um, and, 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 and let me put a little caveat into here, too, because I also feel that even though the teacher, the, the, the flesh and blood, the human element they were talking about in the classroom is critical, as you and I both said, I think that there's going to be something to be said for after school tutoring type of opportunities where where maybe you can't get a teacher, where you could use some of these benefits at, a, at another time. What scares me is, like, uh, let, let's bring about, I don't, I don't like to name companies, but I'm going to, Study Island. You know, Study Island was a great idea. And it was one of those things where, like, man, the kids could take it home and work on it at home. And it was a, it was a great idea to help enhance kids working at, at another time. Well, then all of a sudden it became classrooms. And they had one teacher and they had 30 kids all on Study Island. They were saying, look, the kids are learning. No, they're not. So that's my fear is the concept of this being an opportunity for kids to learn and train outside of the school is a great idea. I think, I think that's got a lot of merit because, again, not everybody can afford a tutor in their home. But when it comes to the school and the, and the classroom and the human element within a teacher, student, flesh and blood, side by side, working through problems, it's second to none. You're, we're, we're, nor should we be looking for an alternative. That's what we have. That's what works. Anything other than that is going to cause us issues that we can't even imagine, I think, at this point. What we have to do, and what you and I talk about all the time, is training those teachers to say, and if you're a teacher watching this right now, be a little afraid. Say, look, if, if everything I'm doing in a classroom right now could be, could be given to a computer to do, maybe I'm not doing my job correctly. You know, that's sort of the, the, the crust of this as well. You know, what I'm doing, my teaching, even for my teachers, I, I like to think that to myself is, are the activities that I'm doing and the training that I'm doing with my teachers, if a computer can do the exact same thing, then really I'm not, I'm, I don't, I'm made myself irrelevant. And, and that's what teachers need to look at. What are you doing as a human flesh and blood being that a computer cannot do or not be able to do in the next three or four years? Keith, go ahead. Bridging the gap between the classroom and the living room is critical and can be facilitated through the use of these technologies. And I agree with you that their misapplication can be a massive hindrance, not only to the individual students who are doing the learning, but it does a disservice to teaching as a whole. 
Um, you mentioned one company. I'll be happy to return the favor and do the same thing. We both do try not to do that. But reflex math is really, really good when it's used in the right way. It can help promote fact fluency and it helps develop the things that we need developed when it comes to skills. That's great. But if you're turning your kids loose on that for 90 minutes at a time and that's all you're doing, you're misutilizing that technology. That is not what it's intended to do. And you are using incorrect pedagogy and invalid teaching practices in that classroom. But as you rightly said, if we rightly apply these technologies and we utilize them outside of teaching and we use them for, let's say, practicing fact fluency, which is much more a form of training than it is teaching, I would go so far as to say it is a legitimate example of training, then having kids do that outside and on top of, particularly in a gamified way that's fun and it's engaging and it's authentically contextualized, I think that's very powerful. And as someone who conceives of two things, one, the school being open, you know, 16, 18, 20 hours a day, I, I don't just want schools, I want learning centers. This is my, you know, insurrectionist all the way down the road, 30 years from now, utopian thing. But I want a place where everyone of all ages is getting all of their needs met all the time, right? If I can help utilize and leverage virtual technologies to do that, especially where children are very far apart from their learning centers, where socioeconomic or home care environments might not let them, where a student's individual physical modalities doesn't lend itself to mobility, there's so many reasons that we can utilize this technology to do more and help more kids, bing, bing, in the way that they need to be helped. If we utilize these tools in a thoughtful way as authentic teachers using good pedagogy, yeah. And that's and that's such the key is don't don't abuse it. Use it, but don't abuse it. You know, that's, that's a great right. phrase. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's absolutely it. Well, hey, uh, this this was a great one. It was it was an enjoyable conversation. And just to let all of our viewers know, uh, Keith and I are going to be in San Antonio uh, in the last week in June. I think you've got a couple presentations. And we're also going to be doing one together. Uh, yep. Revolutionizing the I forget what our what our topic is. Uh, revolutionizing in a Relevance in a Revolutionized Classroom, that's what it's called. And it's going to be a panel discussion. Keith and I are going to be up top. We're going to pull some people out of the audience and set them up with us. And we're going to be having a nice dialogue about how to uh, how to br bring relevance back into our classroom. So uh, if you're going to be in San Antonio for the ISTE conference in the end of June, make sure you look us up. Uh, Keith, what's your uh, Twitter? Is at KD Reeves, right? At Reeves KD. At Reeves KD, and I'm at Dr. Furman, Dr. Furman, and we'd love to hear from you. And don't forget to subscribe to get more videos with the seditionists.